Shaking everybody, it is a Monday, which means on Orange Bloods TV on the YouTube channel, whatever, it's a funky way of saying it. It's Orange Bloods on YouTube. I'm Jeff Ketchum. This is Anwar Richardson. Make sure you do us a solid and click on the subscribe button if you think you might want to watch even another one of these videos down the road. That subscribe button will help. If you like this one, hit the like button. Anwar and I are going to do something a little bit different today. A lot of times on Mondays, we do our Monday Overreactions podcast. Today, we're going to play instead a game of buy or sell. And Anwar, you asked me before we got started if I wanted to know the questions. I do not. I want you to surprise me. I want you to blow my mind. I want to have fun. Hit me. All right. Sit. Because there's nothing to really overreact to right now. Like we're kind of in the dead season. So I tried to say, all right, what have we, what have we got? So I got, I've got five questions. Can you give me a quick overreaction? Of what's that? I think I know where you're headed. You don't. Really? I think it's going to point about my son he always goes uh, viral, than, more viral than me. Well, we could definitely talk about that later because there's a cottage industry just waiting for you to pimp your kids. Apparently. They, they make great social media fodder. But it's amazing. My my old, my youngest son has, was featured on SI when he was like three. Um, my old my old, my oldest son rather was SI when he was three. My oldest went viral um, through to an Uncle Luke video that's still on my Twitter page. If you don't follow me on Twitter, it's Anwar Richardson A N W A R Richardson.com. It's at the top of the page. I went Twitter, went viral, this and that, and I throw up a, a, a casual thing. It's never the stuff you think is ever going to do something. And I just thought I, my son was like miserable about the soccer game, didn't want to participate. And I just threw up a picture of it um, and just asked people to caption it. And it's like got almost like a thousand likes. It's it's crazy. It's had like five hundred like impressions or something. It's, it's crazy. Like the P chart. <laughs> yes, it's the never the stuff when you're trying. But what 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 were you going to say though? I was just gonna plead. So did you have you been keeping up with the Bob Baffert situation with the Kentucky Derby? No. And, okay, so the winner of the Kentucky Derby tested positive for a no no. Okay. And although the results of the race haven't been overturned, Bob Baffert, who like I think he's won like 900 straight Kentucky Derbies, he's been banned from Churchill Downs. Like they banned him, which is pretty hardcore. It is hardcore. So today he went and did a bunch of interviews, and in the interviews he was claiming that uh, his horse is a victim of cancel culture. <laughs> <laughs> and, and instead of just testing positive the horse is now a part of like some smear campaign as part of like we folks stop saying cancel culture we've Everybody. now reached the point like there's there's jumping the shark like fonzie and then there's jumping the shark as if it were shark a sharknado and yeah that we've now reached the point where people are like, yeah, my horse spelled a drug test, but like this cancel culture stuff is bullshit. <laughs> yeah. Dude, it's, it's used everywhere, man. I, I, um, I saw something, a person who was like one of my, uh, it was my mortgage guy. He was complaining about how in his, in his subdivision, he can't hang his, uh, his Austin MLS flag. What's the name of the Austin team? Austin uh, FC. Yeah, so you, you can't hang that. And there was another, like, I want to say it was like another, co his college team. He goes, man, this damn cancel culture. And I appealed to the HOA. And they won't <laughs> let me hang it. And he goes, this cancel culture is everywhere. I'm like, you know, it's, it's at the point, you know what it is, Ketch? It's almost at the point now, you know, when kids say a word, yes. and then you know it's not cool when the adults start saying it. Like the dad. Yes, exactly. It was cool when they did it. And then when older people started doing it, like, uh, it's not cool anymore. That's what cancel culture has come. It's not even cool anymore. They can't even say it because everything is, it's like I get a, a ticket. Cancel <laughs> culture. neighbor can't put up his flag. <laughs> he literally, have, it is HOA, by the way. Yeah. And by the way, he's a mortgage guy. Like, you should know this. Dude, this is what you it's, do. It's crossed over. Whoever started cancel culture as a term, should should be a gazillionaire. Yeah. Now it's everything. It's everything. Yes. So all I'm saying is, guys, let's just find some different words. Because if 
something happens bad on this video, like if my internet goes down, <laughs> I'm just like, <laughs> cancel culture. Yes. Um, All right. Okay. Ready? So we're going to play buy or sell. Yes. Uh, thank you for, I need to do a little, I need a little levity on a Monday. So thank you for uh, allowing me to just get that off my chest. All right, let's do it. So buy or sell. Here's your first question. Buy or sell. Steve Sarkeesian is making a mistake by not attacking offensive line in the transfer market. I mean, buy. It's, it's interesting. You and I both danced around the topic on our columns this weekend, both the Sunday pulpit and my 10 thoughts from the weekend over at orangebloods.com. By the way, go check out, go to the front page of Orange Bloods. We've got a special free trial uh, dedicated to nothing but those of you on YouTube who haven't been on Orange Bloods yet. Um, I would just tell you the code, but I want to say I asked for it to be YouTube because that would be easy and then it just didn't happen. Don't worry way. about it. Guess what? The magic of <laughs> editing, I'll have it magically pop up on the screen. Boom. And I was like, oh, there it is. Right here. Yeah. Um, so bye. But I, I say that with some caveats because they could still address the offensive line. They could still, um, you know, it, it's not too late. It's a little bit like asking me on a couple of days before Christmas whether or not I did all of the shopping that I'm supposed to do. I mean, I can still do it, but, you know, it is late. And I think that – I think the biggest mistake that they probably made – was not being more aggressive early in, like in January. You know, I understand they kind of get caught between a rock and a hard place because they want to be able to see their players in person before really feeling like definitively they know where they should go to get help. And I think they've given that offensive line a lot of benefit of the doubt. I think the coaches like the guys that they're working with. I don't know that they quite – see a huge issue quite the way I think a lot of us do. And maybe they'll also end up being right on that. I think they were a little too patient early on when good, a few good players did enter the portal. And I think that they prioritize defense. I think there's been very few offensive line targets that would have entered the portal that definitively would be upgrades over what Texas has. I do find it interesting, though, that they haven't found anybody, that there's not one non-Power 5 offensive lineman somewhere from the state of Texas that, you know, might want to upgrade or, you know, I. and one of the things I did for Tim Thoughts from the Weekend on War was I looked at all of the Big 12 transfer portal commitments. Six of the 10 teams in the league have found offensive line help in the portal so far this year. Mm. And that does not include Kansas, who may add itself to the list here shortly, considering the entire Buffalo offensive line put itself into the portal after their coach took the Kansas job last week. Mm -hmm. So these schools have looked at the offensive line options in the portal and said, We've got to find somebody. And 60% of the league, potentially 70% of the league, will go into next season saying that they did attempt to upgrade their offensive line situation through the portal. Texas has not done that. And I think it's a combination of these things. I think that they clearly want the type of – that's the, the, the elephant in the room on this may be – Sarkeesian has told us they want massive linemen. He wants big guys on offense. He wants big guys on defense. Those guys typically are hard to find at the McNeese States and the Sam Houston States of the Fair. world. Correct. You can, you can go out and get a guy who's 6'3", 290, and he might be an NFL prospect, but he's not going to be one of these mammoth monsters – that I think they prefer on both sides of the ball. And so I think there's something to be said for they would rather just stick with what they have if the right guy on the offensive line or their appetite doesn't reveal itself. Um, but I would have done more. I think this is 
we have, for the better part of the last three, really the last decade around here, gone into season saying this team is an offensive line injury or two away from really being up, you know what, creep without a paddle because the depth, at the very least, the depth isn't where it needs to be. I think you really say that about this group right now. I absolutely can buy into the idea that Kyle Flood can find five guys out of this group that can turn into a good offensive line unit. Totally acceptable. Sure. But I think that this is a program that that is a tall ask. I don't know that it has the depth. And look, you can say this on some level about every offensive line in the country that you start losing starters and things change. But I don't know that Texas has six or seven guys that they can legitimately play with on Saturdays. I think they hope they can, but it's asking a lot of guys that haven't done it yet to do it all at once after one off season. And that feels like after 10 years of chasing fool's gold, the type of thing that I don't know that I give the benefit of the doubt to I don't know what the answer is, but I would have taken a couple of those defensive spots and I probably would have dedicated them to finding offensive linemen somewhere, even if not the ideal physical profile that this staff clearly covets on that side of the ball. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's interesting because when we start thinking about what the line is, I had to like pull it up on my phone. So if we're thinking about, you know, you know, like Christian Jones, Junior Angelau, um, you know, the Kerstetter, you know, at center, Okafor, you know, switching between right guard and, and right tackle, and uh, you know, and, and Kersick, uh, uh on the on the outside. I mean, that probably solid. You know, that probably gets the job done uh, for what they're needing to do. And then, you know, they've got the, you know, the Tyler Johnsons that are out there. Said to- they, they praised Topi Amade, you know, at, at some point in the spring. You still got Isaiah, Isaiah Hookfin. So maybe, you know, they feel like, okay, this is serviceable. This gets us through year one um, where it won't kill us. It may, it may not be great, but it won't kill us, right? But to your point, like that does, it does seem like, it, there was a, maybe a potential for an upgrade, but it's, it's it is what you what you said is really it reminded me of something I remember catch when I was in Tampa. I think I've told you this before. And John Gruden was the coach there, and the one thing he talked about it was as it relates to the draft. He would say when it came to for his draft strategy was always when you find big athletic men, you draft them. Because it's a good thing, because he's not a lot of athletic, and you know this kid, they're not a whole lot of athletic six foot three, 330 pound men walking the face of the earth, right? So, to your point, what does a six foot four guy who's 300 at McNeese look like versus six four in the, you know, in any of the major conferences? It's a huge difference. I mean, it's just a huge difference of athleticism, both are big, but how many are athlete, a- athletic enough to play the position and on this level? So, I've got to believe that Kyle Flood and a clearly a Sarkeesian understand how what they need from an offensive line perspective. And it just seems like they seem to be okay with what the offense is doing and they seem to be fine. Like it's almost, and it, it maybe there's a, a, there's a part of him that believes like no matter what he can scheme, scheme themselves out of certain situations. Like I'm, I'm okay. I can game plan this and, 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 and hide our weaknesses, but you know, the one thing you can't hide in the big 12 is a bad defense, right? Catch. I mean, that that's the one thing that will get exposed in the big 12, no matter what people want to say about this conference, teams will put up points on you quick, quick. Look at, look at last season, catch, look how Texas fell behind in, in, in those early games because of how that defense played. They needed a miracle to pull off that Texas tech win. The, the math on that was like Bitcoin math. You know, as far as being able to pull that thing off and they were able to do that and and they fell behind, you know, another time. And so um, and then even like the Oklahoma game, I mean, you get up and you got the momentum and then all of a sudden what happens, the defense, the collapse. So I think he looks at it and said, you know what, of all the things that we need to sure up and my spots are available, I can figure out some shit on offense. But this defensive thing. 
man, I don't want to be having to score 50 points, you know, to, and going into overtime and trying to pull it out. So I, you know, I definitely think so. I will probably, you and I are probably like a soft buy on that. I don't think yeah. you and I are bang, banging the table. This would be something that may become, you know, next year we're, we're totally like, man, he's screwed it up because to your point, it, it is hard to find. And I, I just think he's, he's thinking I, I'll figure this thing out. All right. So let me give you a second one. Okay. Buy or sell number two catch. Regardless of who wins the quarterback competition, Texas is still about a nine win team. No, bye. Okay. I, that may be one of the <clears throat> real elephants in the room with regards to the quarterback battle is that the winner, the winner of that versus the loser of that battle may not actually change the, the trajectory of this season, which probably has them scrapping for a spot in the Big 12 championship game. And they'll have to, you know, this is a team that'll have to go on the road in Ames, Iowa, probably to win that game to get into the Big 12 championship game. Otherwise, you know, if, if Oklahoma potentially is just better than Texas this year, and they may very well be, then you're playing that game in Ames. It's on the road. It's against a very experienced team. And it might just be that Texas isn't quite ready for that, regardless of who the quarterback is. So, yeah, you know, I, I, I think the correct over and under for this team right now is 8.5. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't begrudge anybody who straddles either side of that equation. It's when – you start going above that that I have questions because I don't know this. It's just a massive amount of benefit of the doubt that you would be giving this program. When I think there really are question marks all over the field for the Longhorns. Um, you know, we're talking about a team that, as we've talked about in the last couple of weeks, is not full of NFL ready players that we feel like, oh, yeah, that's a first or second day guy. Absolutely. There's one on offense. There's maybe one on defense. And then there's a lot of guys that have upside, but arrive into this season as unfinished products. And that's not just a quarterback issue. I, I you know, if this was a ready-made team with replacing a quarterback, and it was a matter of these guys just adding water, instant player because of what's around them, then that would be one thing. But this is a wide receiver unit that we don't completely trust. It's an offensive line that we have question marks about. It is a team that lacks playmakers on both sides of the ball. Elite level quarterback play, I think, really upgrades everybody around you. But I don't know that the winner of this battle is quite ready to put that hat on yet. I think you and I have both kind of subscribed to the idea that whoever the starter ends up being at the quarterback position in reality, 2022 may be the real season when this program and whoever wins the quarterback battle, both this year, and maybe even if it were to go into next year, that may be when everything really is ready to come together in a way where it, it, it that decision really impacts whether or not this team is championship ready or not. And I'm not so sure that that's where it is yet. Yeah. I'm a buy on that one too, catch in, you know, for a lot of the reasons that, that you outline, you know, at the end of the day, you still got guys who are going to play that don't really have a, a large body of work. So to lean on, I understand like, it's like credit, right? How do you get credit? You got to get a line of credit. And then you ask someone for a line of credit. They're like, well, you can't get it. Why? Cause you don't have credit. Right. So it's easy to knock them and say, well, you haven't played and like, well, yeah, but how do I play if you let you get me on the field? But that being said, you know, they, they the, whichever quarterback gets thrown in catch, I mean, they get thrown into the Lions then in, in week one. I mean, they're, they're not – there's – you know, Rice doesn't come in week one and you get a chance to build some momentum, right? And Oklahoma, I think, does, does a really good job of building momentum throughout the year because Oklahoma's not really, for the most part, trying to put a lot of killers on the first part of the schedule. Now, they did they had played Houston before. Um, Ohio State. 
and they have played Ohio State, right? And so, but they've also mixed in the armies of the world, you yeah. know? So, uh, you know, and I think one of the things that, that Tom Herman and the previous uh, staffs wanted was like, hey, stop all this tough, you know, scheduling of, of, of in his first three games. Like the, the conference schedule is enough. Give us some gimmies in the first three. Uh, but, you know, they didn't want Michigan and Florida and Alabama and Ohio State, you know, and they have to do that for various reasons, obviously, because, um, you know, they're trying to entice the home schedule, home and away schedule. So that being said, the, the, whoever quarterback gets thrown in, whichever quarterback gets thrown in, gets thrown into the fire pretty quickly. And I don't know really that there's that many different things. You know, maybe Hudson Card has a little bit of a stronger arm. I think I would propose that Casey Thompson has a little bit better of a, of a touch. From a speed perspective, Hudson Card played receiver in high school. So, the, you know, you can't act like Hudson Card can't run the ball if the pocket, you know, breaks down. Hudson Card can probably do that just as easily as Casey Thompson can do. And, you know, Casey Thompson isn't, that typical dual threat guy. Like we don't view him, you know, in a Kyler Murray type of like, Oh my God, look at that kind of speed. You're just like, okay, maybe you can break the pocket a little bit. Um, but in the spring game, we also saw Casey take, you know, take a couple of sacks as well when he was kind of going back and trying to do a little bit too much like the, you know, you would do in high school. So, but at the end of the day, at, at this moment catch, I don't look at either one and say, Damn it, man, that there is guaranteed 10. That's a guaranteed 11. That's, that's went, you know, undefeated. I just look at it and say, okay, to your point, catch, whoever wins it, okay, you might, you might win the competition, but you're still going to – I, I can't see one being so much better than the other where we're going to look back and say, what the hell? It really comes down to whether or not one of these guys is – from an int- you know, what I love about Hudson Card is his physical talent. So he, I think, I think as a passer, he does everything better than Casey Thompson. But I think one area that should not be underestimated is that I think in the pocket and as a decision maker, Casey Thompson, with all due respect to the pick six that he threw in the spring game, I think with the limited amount of sample size that we have from him, he feels like a guy that's calm, that situations don't, he doesn't panic, I guess. And whatever that play in the spring was, he didn't panic. And so he's got, you know, he's got a little ice water in his veins. I think we saw that in the Alamo Bowl. I think whatever credit you don't want to give him, I think you have to give him credit for that, that this is a guy that does not flinch in a spot. Sure. And it is one of the things I don't know yet about Hudson Carr because, and you, if somebody wanted to make the case and say, we truly don't know it about Casey Thompson yet either. Okay. I guess, but I do feel like I've seen more of Casey than I had. I have seen of Hudson at this level in terms of being put into places and there's still a proven it thing with Hudson that I think is a little bit more bankable with Casey and what these coaches where this changes for me on war is if Sarkeesian behind the scenes started to talk about one of these quarterbacks. And I guess for me, it would probably be, have to be Hudson card, but you know what, if, if I was hearing this behind the scenes about Casey Thompson, it would change the way I feel about that as well. I want to hear that he's talking about one of these quarterbacks, the way that Tom Herman talked about Sam Ellinger. <laughs> well, that's love. That is love. That's that. That's that. I always joked, but I, you know, I always thought that Tom Herman had like the screensaver of Sam on his phone. Well, you like, know, he did. It did. Like I don't think he had Michelle on his phone. Like I think it was like <laughs> it, it pop up. You know, like, you no know, saying like I've got my boys on mine. I am sure this picture would have would have Sam. He loves him some Sam. Loved. Yes, absolutely. So, and wouldn't even have to necessarily go to that level. But hearing Sar, you know what I mean? Like, you know what I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah, it, I know what you're saying. It doesn't have to be screensaver level. But, like, I feel like we're hearing whispers that Kyle Flood loves his line more than I'm hearing that the quarterbacks coach loves his quarterbacks. And, you know, it's, it's, it's sometimes it's not what we hear or what is said. It's what's not heard and what's not said. And 
I don't know what I'm looking for, but I'll know it when I see it. And I don't know that I'm hearing that yet with regards of the one position that could lift this, I think, program truly up. And, you know, I, it's not a sin. Like Steve Sarkeesian will not have failed if in his first season in a conference where there will be two teams in it that start the year in the, in the top 10, that return tons of experience and starters, Mm-hmm. And neither of those games is at home. So it, if if Texas goes nine and three or ten and two, and they win almost all the games they're supposed to win, but lose on a neutral field to an Oklahoma team that on paper right now looks better than them, and loses on the road to an Iowa State team that returns like forty seven starters, <laughs> then like you know, but they win the rest. Like that's going to be a good season. But even that only then leaves them wiggle room for. It's why I'm on the fence at 8.5 yeah yeah. those are two games that you could justifiably say yeah they're probably going to lose those games then it's do they run the table and perfect against everything else and it's really hard for me to say yeah that's definitely going to happen where's uh is oklahoma state where's is that in stillwater this year catch do you have the schedule in front of you god last season's such a blur i know I won't look no, it up. I, I don't have the schedule, but they no, they, they have a difficult road schedule. It, it's not. I got it right here. So okay. at, at Arkansas, at the Louisiana, they're at Arkansas. They have Rice. They got Tech, obviously here at home. So they're at TCU. So it goes. So they open up the conference schedule versus Tech. Um, then they're at TCU, Oklahoma neutral field. They do have Oklahoma State here. They're at Baylor at Iowa State, Kansas is at home, at West Virginia, and then at home versus Kansas State. I mean, it's not a, a, a gauntlet, but three or four of those games are legitimately, you know, toss-up type affairs. Like, Which, I, which, which one did you put as a toss-up? TCU, Oklahoma State, you know? I think – I think TCU is the obvious one. Until this team beats Daddy Patterson, Patterson's daddy. And all that guy has done for the most part is beat Texas's left and right in big, bad ways since he's been playing them. So I think that, you know, you got to give that TCU squad the benefit of the doubt. They always play Texas hard. I think that that Arkansas game is tricky. I had a question this weekend about whether or not I thought Texas would be one and one after the first two games. I'm saying sell to that, that I think they're two and oh, but both of those games are tricky. And as somebody who's made multiple trips to Fayetteville for games, for Texas games against Arkansas in his lifetime, that's, I know what that trip's going to be. I just, I know. And it doesn't matter that Arkansas might be a four win team they'll be a nine win team on the night that they play Texas. And, you know, I never really know what to expect in a game against West Virginia. I never really know what to, yeah, I just, I think that te- the majority, I think seven of the eight games, seven or eight ish of the games this season, maybe six, they're absolute layups, but there's some tricky games. Oklahoma state is tricky. It has proven to be that over the course of the last decade, whether it's at home or not, that it almost the home team in that game almost seems to play poorly in, for whatever reason. Yeah, it's a good point. You know, it feels like those, it feels like the best games that Texas has played in recent years on the road have come in Stillwater. Yeah, and it feels point. like they've lost games at home against Oklahoma State. And sometimes it's been the officiating. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's been a low scoring game. We saw Mason Rudolph steal a win one year. You know what I mean? Like it's just. So the officials, the officials went crazy one year. And, yeah. Uh, it, I bumped Charlie Strong and then penalized him for it. So it feels like there are two really hard games on this schedule, but then it feels like there are four or five that I would just describe as. 50, 50, 60, 40, 40, 60, somewhere in that range. And Texas plays a lot of games like that. They have. Yeah. And what would really be impressive for Sarkeesian in his first year, forget about those other two games, Oklahoma and Iowa State for a second. 
if Texas just starts beating the brakes off of teams that are below them, you know, you're always asking me how many five stars does it take to beat some of these teams, mm-hmm, like ECU mm-hmm. and Oklahoma State, and the, yeah. you know, and, and it is always a, 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 a we could go down a rabbit hole there, but you wouldn't ask those questions. If, if this was just about beating Oklahoma, that would be one thing, but Texas's problem is that it plays seven or eight 50, 50 games all year. And at the end of it, they go nine and three and they're like, Oh, we we're two plays away from being 11 and one. It's like, well, yeah, but you were also an onside kick away in yeah. love. It. You know what I mean? Just, you, that mm-hmm. works both ways. Correct. And so it's how nine and three teams can be six and six and 12 and zero in the same. If they just win all their coin flips. Well, sometimes most of the time you, you it's an even split. Some years you lose more of them. And I want to see this Texas program. I'll know when it's really making forward progress mm-hmm. when the Kansases and the Kansas States and the Texas Techs of the world, Texas is beating by two and three scores. And then it's really about how you perform in those biggest games. Yeah. But this hasn't been a team and a program that really has been renowned because for its good or poor play in big games. It hasn't been good enough to be defined that way. And it makes it really hard for me to look at it in year one under Sarkeesian and, and view that through the prism of the only the biggest games on the schedule. These players have to prove that they warrant that kind of benefit of the doubt. And it hasn't been done yet. Yeah. And before I move on to, to number three, to, to echo what you're saying, even if we go past the, the loss against Kansas a few years ago, um, just two two seasons ago, catch it was life or death. Like they needed a come from behind, like drive the length of the field type of thing just to beat Kansas. To your point, I would have to go back, catch and really look up over the past how many years, seven years or so. What's the probably the, the largest margin of victory that Texas has had against a conference opponent? I Kansas imagine State last year, <laughs> which, which which was it? <laughs> Kansas State last year. What was that score? Let me look it up. I'm doing I mean, all this in real time. I got I got it in front of me. People think I'm not text messaging. I'm actually looking up things. Um, you know, it's crazy to me is you were yeah, asking. 6931. That's right. 6931. <laughs> that that was the largest. That was the crazy. Yeah, that was a hell of a stretch. Those, those Didn't last save two. Tom's job, but they did beat the brakes off of Kansas State last year. That's one of the few times. But then if you just go back through it, it was 6356. A 31-30, uh, 33-31 loss to TCU. The loss against OU in five, uh, five, four overtimes, 53-45. 27-16 win against Baylor. 41-34 against Oklahoma State. 17 I mean, all these are nail biters. It was just nail biters, like, all the way around. So to your point, Catch, and I'll move on to question number three. I get you. It's hard to look at this team and – and say, oh, okay, now all of a sudden someone's come in and it's going to be like the, what Oklahoma does. Oklahoma worries about beating Texas every year and maybe a, a one other program that kind of raises up and, you know, Iowa State maybe had a chance last year. and um, But that's really about it. And then it just blow, they blow out everyone else and do what they need to do. Texas hasn't been there yet. Okay, number three, for your buy or sell. You're doing good, Cash. Uh, We're doing good. Bijan Robinson will lead the Big 12 in rushing yards this season. Buy or sell? I'll go buy. Okay. Okay. I'll go buy. I, I think that I, I, I immediately thought of Oklahoma and, and Tennessee transfer Eric Gray, but they have Kennedy Brooks on that team as well. And I think there's a better chance that both of those guys have a thousand yards rushing than there is that one of those guys has 1,500 yards rushing. So I really think that, you know, then I look at Iowa State, I, you know, the kid, at, the Vaughn kid at Kansas State is a, sne- a sleeper in this discussion because you got to ask yourself what, what programs have mm. running backs that they're going to be giving the ball to at levels that would allow them to lead the league in rushing – I might contend that Deuce Vaughn is a very yeah. stealthy little gam- like little wager there because 
we know towards the end of the season, he was their offense, that they would give him the ball as many times as he needed. He did deliver more times than not. It wouldn't surprise me at the end of the year if he were to be the guy that ends up leading the Big 12 and rushing. But yeah, no, I'd buy, I'll buy Bijan for now. Okay, just, just, just to make sure I mean, we have everyone out there on the list for you, okay? Brees Hall from Iowa State, last season, had 279 carries. 1,572 yards and 21 touchdowns. Um, so I, I want to make sure we... And he's, and he's probably the betting favorite, I would think. I would go with him, right? There's there's Kennedy Brooks from, from OU, which you've kind of, you know, mentioned for. It was, you know, buck 55 for 1,000 yards, 1,011 yards, six touchdowns. Um, you, you mentioned you Deuce Vaughn. Uh, Letty Brown from West Virginia had about a thousand yards, uh, buck 99, 10, 10 on the ground with nine touchdowns. Let's keep going through here. LD Brown from Oklahoma state. We'll, we'll see what that looks like. The Hall kid from Iowa state. I mean, yeah. that's an incredible amount of volume. And now, I mean, think about it. that was with two less games. Yes. Yes. I mean, Wow. You know, that is probably a seventeen or eighteen hundred yard season that just won't be remembered that way because of the fewer games they played. But yeah, you know what? I'll sell. <laughs> okay, okay. I just want to change my mind. Yeah, yeah. I would want. I wanted to make sure we had out there because I think. Yeah, I mean, he yeah twelve, and you know, just so you know, I'm looking up his his previous. Um, I forgot that he had that kind of a year. Yeah, in 2019. He, he had a 186 attempts for 897 um, and nine touchdowns. So in, in 2019, he averaged 11 a touch. Last year, with a more of an increased volume, he was about 7.8 yards per carry. It's pretty good. Actually, no, I take it back. I take, no, 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 wait, wait. I want to make sure I got that right. Yeah, I should put I should put in my reading glasses. Actually, it looks like about five point six, maybe. I'm just like five point six. Uh, he was at seven point eight from his. Re- uh, just admit it, you're blind point, without your glasses. I need them, but so, here's the deal. So, if I put the readers on with the light, yeah. If it's here, it's reflecting. It looks like alien. If it's here, but now I look like I'm like huddling in, and so I try to take it off to make it look, you know, okay. Yeah. yeah. But now I can't read. You do your damned if you don't. Yeah, I can read. So this 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 is the part of aging. This is what happens. Um, with you, catch, I, I I will sell on it. Just because I think Reese Hall is that good. Just because Iowa State returns, like to your point, everybody. I mean, offensive line, quarterback. I mean, they've got their whole unit that's coming back. Um, I would put the money on Brees. I like Bijan. I like his upside. I like the potential. But I still say, when it comes to Bijan, we're still talking about. Three games from last season. I'm not saying they weren't three very good games. Two were amazing. But we're talking about three games. Um, it's hard to then for me to say upper echelon, like he's going to be better than this guy. Now, he may end up being better than Kennedy Brooks. He may be number two, and that's no disrespect to him. I mean, you might be looking at from this these guys here. I mean, you, you might be looking at at least three, potentially four running backs catch that could be – day one to day two picks in the future, whatever years that they come out right now, cause you may not see a running back of that group of the guys that we've mentioned past that goes past maybe the fourth round. Cause we understand that, yeah. the, 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 you know, the NFL views running backs a little bit differently than we do. I mean, as great as Najee was in Alabama, he still was a late first round pick. And he was all world. The NFL looks at the end of running backs differently. So that's why I say one through four. But really, they start coming off the board around that second round, day twos when they start. So these guys are good. So, so for Bijan to be in that mix says a lot about what we think of him. But yeah, we'll, we'll, we, we gotta, you got to give Brees the, uh, the nod on that one. Put some damn respect on that name. <laughs> Absolutely. We, we sure the hell did for you, Brees. <laughs> um, number four. This is an interesting projection question for you. Because you got to remember, here's the caveat on this. Last year didn't count towards a kid's eligibility, okay? So when you look at rosters, you guys look at rosters this year, you're going to see it's going to be a repeat of last year. So everything was – if you used to, the guy was a junior last year, he's you know a junior what? this year. That's not what Bianco told me they were going to do. What did he say he's going to do? He, is he going to forward it? They were going forward with it. 
and they would deal with it later if the player like wanted to then take another year of eligibility. So, you know, if a junior was a junior, they'll list him as a senior. And then if he decides he wants to come back and be a senior, then, then that would be what they would do. But, you know, well, that, that was all like, it was, that was a, this isn't what we're definitely going to do, but this is what I think we're going to do when I asked him about it. So I don't want to put him on the spot in, in the event that they've changed that. But I asked him that question because we were trying to figure I was when I was doing a war room article and trying to slot everybody into the right mm-hmm. grade classification. That's how the, that was the indication of what was expected to be done. But I think it's going to be a school by school basis. Well, that's going to be confusing as hell. It is going to be so confusing. Yeah, that's going to be confusing. I don't know how we do that. So let's operate under <laughs> the assumption that this guy will still be a junior. Let's start from there. Okay. Yes. Deshaun Jameson will forego his extra year of eligibility and enter the NFL draft after next season. Bye. Okay. You be- it, and why are you buying that? Well, I think just because these kids all have years of eligibility extra if they want them, I don't view kids who view themselves as Sunday players lining up for an extra year of college football just because. So, you know, I, I think Deshaun Jameson will be at that place where if he has a good season, it's time to go get paid. And, you know, the guys that take those extra seasons thus far are guys, I mean, you know, you look at this roster of guys who's coming back for another season. It's all guys that need college football more than college football needs them. And I'll, I guess I put Deshaun Jameson in the category of, College football needs him more than he needs college football at this point. I mean, Derek Kerstetter wouldn't be coming back this year if he didn't have to. He had the bad injury, and he felt like he needed to. I kind of view Deshaun Jamison the same way. Barring something that happens that that changes the way we view him for uncontrollable reasons, if that guy just plays 12, 13, 14 games this year, I think he's headed off to the NFL. Yeah, I, I would, I would, I would say yes. He's doing, he's definitely going to go um, buy in on, on that question just because if he progresses the way that we think he could potentially progress, probably one, he's a breakout candidate. And I don't know, can he be a breakout candidate? I don't know. We, it would definitely be taking his whatever level we thought he was to another level, which I think we all believe like he can definitely do. I also think his what he's able to do on special teams. Uh, it will be very appealing to, uh, to a lot of teams to be able to say, okay, I've got this guy who can return kicks and return punts and be able to play, you know, on, on defense. Like I, I think his upside is, is there. You know, I don't know how many other guys, you know, well, that's probably a, 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 I'm trying to think of what other guys would go outside of Deshaun. I mean, I guess Coburn would go if he had, you know, a, you know, good enough year. Um yeah, that goes back to like who who do we think? You know, oh yes, of course, Demarion Overshone, you know, probably goes. But to your point, catch guys who are hanging around, who who are here for their, you know, who are super seniors. You know, to your point, like those are guys more than like they're coming back because they couldn't go into the NFL, and they're hoping that either one or two, they're hoping that by coming back one more year, that improves their draft stock, so they can go in hopefully into the NFL. And then if not, they just go, you know go about their business and go about getting on their lives. But Deshaun James, I thought I might, I might, I thought I might trick you a little bit on that one. I guess I should have found someone else. Maybe I should have gone to Cameron Dicker or something, you know, because Cameron Dicker, Cameron Dicker, let me tell you on, on the sneaky low, on a sneaky low, he can punt and he might be a better punter than he actually is a kicker. Like just throwing that out there, he might be a guy that a team looks at really late and says, you know what? Why the hell not? Because this guy can I mean, do I both. Think Dicker absolutely goes to a camp. Like kicking, it's such a hard world to break into. It and is. once you do, you can stick around forever. Ever, ever, ever. But no offense to Cameron Dicker, I've seen better kickers at UT. You know, we, they're not all. <laughs> They're not all, you know, some of the guys that we've seen. They're not all Justin Tucker. And there have been really good players that just went to NFL camps 
But I mean, it wouldn't shock me. Like I think Cameron Dicker is going to go to an NFL camp. I don't know what I think about his long-term, you know, projections at that next level, but I think it's possible. I don't completely dismiss it. Well, the, th- the thing is there was the, who was the kick? There was a kicker during like Charlie's year. I try to look it up to see if I can find it. And he may still be when Charlie was here and he may still be in the NFL right now. Um, but it just will make for a bad broadcast if I just speculate on it. I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there. I'm like, we'll, we'll, we'll come back. Well, I don't know how many Cameron Dicker uh, podcasts or shows we'll have, but maybe at some point we'll talk more about him. All right. Number, this is the last one. Number five, catch. Last one of your buy or sell. And this is, this goes right into your area of expertise and goes right into what you do. Buy or sell, Sarkeesian will finish with a top five recruiting class in 2022. Bye. Okay. Yeah, no, I think, look, if you're Texas and you're Texas A&M, you can almost sleepwalk your way to a top 10, top 15 classes. You can leave, as long as things aren't terrible and destitute, you can put it on autopilot and, and sign 15 or 16 four-star kids and you'll be fine. But the question is whether or not you get that next layer, that thing that takes expected recruiting classes to the next level I don't know what it looks like in 2023, 2024, 2025. Some of that will be predicated upon the success that Texas has in the program. But I absolutely believe in year one that, that Steve Sarkeesian will have a top five class. Okay. Well, that's all right. Again, I have to lean on your expertise on, on that one. Is that is that on the because of Malik Murphy and where, where he's at? I mean, do you think he's- I've never guy- wavered. I've said that before. I said that the day he was hired. Now, last thing on that, though, Catch, do you think any of this will be predicated on how this team does during the season? Do you think no matter what, I mean, if this team finishes with eight or nine wins, you do you feel like that has Top no five, effect? No matter what. Top okay. five, no matter what. Okay. You're, all right. You're all, you're all chips in. Yeah. I mean, I'm not wavering now. I think actually very – there will be a handful of players – that will wait to see Texas this season. And in reality, the players that are waiting to see Texas this season, they're not going to end up at Texas. I think that there's a first year honeymoon that every head coach at the University of Texas gets in his first full season of recruiting. And I expect Steve Sark with a staff that is as good of recruiters as they are. I believe that... Yeah, top five. I've, I've said it from day one. There's no reason for me to back off now. Okay, well, if you are going to buy on that, then I'm only buying because you bought the groceries in front of me. So I saw you pick it out, and then I said, all right, I'm buying because of that. And I'll lean on your expertise. I think it would be a disappointing finish to be 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. That's a bad year. Let me tell you why. Because that means they didn't get difference makers. If – they finish in the top five. That means they got some five stars. That means they got more kids like Xavier Worthy, the kid that just signed uh, a national top 70 player from California after the spring game that was Michigan's top commitment. You know, what really makes separates a top five class from a top 10 class more times than not is there's four, five, six B. John Robinsons in a class and not one or two. And if Texas finishes outside the top five, it's because they didn't get enough of the guys that were elite of the elite in state in a year where there's a lot of them in state. It's one, it's a historically good year in the state of Texas. I don't think that I, I think both Texas and Texas A&M will finish either top five or on the cusp of that, a spot, you know, sixth, like it, and, or a very close seventh, but I expect both of them to rake this year in recruiting. Okay. Let me ask you one question and I'll, and you, you don't have to even kick it back to me. You can just close it uh, after you answer the question, which is, you know, I think the, the last uh, recruiting uh, calendar, if I'm correct, I thought, I think offensive line in the state of Texas was one of the deepest ones. Was it this past one? Was it 2021 or 2020? Yes. 
2021 was one of the deepest uh, there. So where do you feel like in the state of Texas, it, the, the, they are just dogs everywhere? Um, what position group do you say? Well, I think offensive line again this year. I think the, the saving grace for Texas potentially is that after getting shut out in a historically good offensive line class in 2021, fate has given the state of Texas yet another class in that same breath. And so they get a redo. And I think that as it was a year ago is, is, that it, is exactly the way that it is in 2022. So they won't be able to sign enough this year. They're legitimately, you know, I mean, there's a half dozen guys that are in worthy contention for high four-star, five-star status in this state alone at the offensive line position. And that's before you even get to guys like Cam Williams out of Duncanville, who Texas just recently offered, will be bringing in on an official visit where you're talking about a guy that's a definitely a state top 25 national top 250 guy it's deep top heavy middle heavy every kind of heavy possible so yeah it's the first position that comes to mind this year uh is at the offensive line position i think quarterback stands out a little bit because you've got yours you've got club nick you've got the kid committed to a&m there are guys that I think are a tier or two below them that I think have a chance to end up being really good college players, potentially great college players, but aren't getting the attention because it's a year where they're, you know, you could, you could make a case that Dave Campbell's Texas football this year, the cover should be the three quarterbacks in state. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. we're talking heavy once committed to Ohio state, once committed to Clemson and the other one's committed to A&M. Yeah. Like, that's rare too. So, Weigman, is that his name? Yeah, Connor Weigman. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think you know the, the that trio. Not in addition to what I think again are another four or five quarterback prospects this year that will go under the radar because they're not those guys. But it wouldn't surprise me if one or two of those guys ends up being all conference level players at the next level or even NFL prospects when it's all said and done. All right, man. We'll go ahead and close this out, Catch. Hit the subscribe button. We're on our way to the first 2,000 subscribers. Uh, We'd love for you to be a part of that. Like the video if you enjoyed our little buy or sell segment uh, today. Otherwise, um, same bat time, same bat channel tomorrow. We'll be doing this all week long here on the Orange Bloods YouTube channel. Y'all take care. Be good to each other. Later.